Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for some really late afternoon tea. There's a whole heck of a lot of news to get through, including a presidential visit to Ohio and an update from Governor Mike DeWine. But before we unpack all of that, let me show off what I'm munching on. Today I made pau de queijo, basically a cheesy Brazilian roll, although this is not an authentic version per our resident Brazilian Hanada Clo, but it's still cheese and it's still bread, so it's still delicious. And I branched out a little bit and I actually got some whole beans from Zingerman's, which isn't completely local, but it's just right up the road in Ann Arbor and they are always fantastic. But my mug is from Handmade Toledo. I've showed it off once before, but it's one of my favorite mugs and one of my favorite places. But without further ado, let's get into the news. Let's start with a quick update on Toledo City Council. The city has continued to mourn the loss of TPD officer Anthony Dia, and as a reminder, Dia was shot and killed in the line of duty back on the 4th of July. Anthony's dad, Tony Dia, has been pretty vocal about fostering support for law enforcement, and he's been pushing for the long-term adoption of Anthony's role. Named, of course, after his son, it would require officers to ride in pairs. But Tony's kicking things up a notch, proving he's ready to make some serious change. Just yesterday, he announced his intent to run for Toledo City Council. You know, the city meant a lot to him. He gave his life for the city, and this is the least I can do if I'm able to do it in his name. Now, we don't know exactly when he'll enter the local political arena, but we do know there are a number of temporary vacancies on council right now. And unless you've been living under a rock, you should know that is because there are four Toledo City Council members on voluntary suspension from their positions as they await the verdict in their federal bribery cases. And President Donald Trump got to hang out in Ohio yesterday, making a quick stop at the Clyde Whirlpool plant before heading off to a fundraising event closer to Cleveland. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you, Dan. I'm thrilled to be in the great state of Ohio. You were very good to me, but I've been very good to you. I've been very good to you. We've been good to each other. While the president was at Whirlpool, he made some big promises to American workers. So let's take a look at some of those. First, he vowed to defeat coronavirus, saying a vaccine for COVID-19 will come sooner than people think. Next, he promised prosperity and economic resiliency after the virus is defeated. Third, he vowed to turn America into the premier medical manufacturer of the world, saying that the U.S. can't rely on China and other nations for our medical essentials. He promised to onshore millions of new manufacturing jobs across other sectors, and the president then said he would bring back American jobs using every tool at his disposal. And finally, he vowed to put American workers first, always. The president also took some time to reflect on his tariff plan that saved Whirlpool while pointing the blame for the plant's past issues at the Obama-Biden administration. Now, Governor Mike DeWine was supposed to greet the president, but he hit a bit of a snag on the way to the airport. DeWine took a rapid test, as is required before getting FaceTime with the Prez, which shockingly turned up a positive result. Of course, DeWine was then sent home and the people closest to him were notified and tested, plus they tested him again, this time with the normal tests that most of us would get. The governor held a video conference giving people an update on what the heck was happening, saying he had no idea how he could have gotten the virus and clarifying that he felt fine. And it's not surprising that he felt completely fine because when that second test came back, it was negative. He was negative for the coronavirus. False alarm, everyone. Let's pack up. Time to go home, which is good news for the governor, but also bad news for the governor because social media has been a whirlwind ever since, questioning the trustworthiness of these tests and calling the state data into question. But okay, DeWine did clarify a few things. That first test he got was an antigen test, which he said are pretty new and not really used in Ohio. But that second test was a PCR test. So what's the difference? And is one more reliable? When we think about testing that we typically do across Ohio, that's called PCR testing. A PCR test looks at the genetic makeup of the virus and zooms right in on it. So it's pretty sensitive. It's been used a lot, so the experts are already well aware of its strengths and of its weaknesses. Dr. Peter Moeller said that this is the gold standard of COVID testing, so A plus, great job. But antigen tests don't even look at the genetic material. Instead, they're busy checking out the protein on the surface of the virus. So Moeller said they aren't as sensitive, which may cause false positive or false negative results. But Dr. Moeller says there are some benefits. The good part is, is you're going to be able to have lots of these across the field. And the key point of what we call point of care testing, which these enable, is that 
you can find out results within 15 or 20 minutes. And so for the epidemiologists of the world, you're allowed, you're, you're very quickly able to do contact tracing, be able to quarantine people, and be able to make decisions on healthcare. But again, how reliable are they really? I have three types of tests listed, molar put antigen tests right at the bottom. But again, these are new, so doctors are still learning about how and when they can effectively be used. But let's pause for a moment to talk about schools. There's a lot of chaos right now, as Governor Mike DeWine issued earlier this week a mask order requiring students K through 12 to wear a face covering when they return to school. And locally, there's guidances now that are asking schools to start virtually. But let's focus here on that last one just a little bit. The Lucas County Regional Board of Health is now recommending schools start virtually and push back fall sports until at least October 1st. And the one thing I want to make sure is clear right off the bat is that this is an order. The department does have the authority to issue orders, but for whatever reason they decided not to do that at this point. But there are a few reasons why the board is telling students to stay home. One of the first points is that case numbers in young people are on the rise, and not just for our young adults. The health department used this graph to demonstrate the rapid increase in cases for kids 0 through 19, especially between the months of May and August. But some people might wonder, what's the big deal? According to the Mayo Clinic, most kids who are infected typically don't become as sick as adults, and some may not even show symptoms at all, which is obviously good news. But the board repeatedly said on Thursday that the concern isn't so much with the kids, while, I mean, of course, they don't want kids getting sick. The bigger problem, though, is with the adults that they come into contact with. From teachers to custodians, there are a number of school workers who could be put at risk, not to mention the people each kid brings those germs home to. Now, the CDC says that as long as you have low numbers in the community, kids should be able to go back to school. But right now, the situation isn't so hot in Lucas County. As of yesterday, we had 183 cases per 100,000 people. And in the words of our beloved health commissioner, Eric Jajinski, Low is not 183 per 100,000. So, cool. In fact, out of all 88 counties, Dwine listed Lucas as the second highest for this metric. So we really need to get our butts in gear. But for some perspective, Jajinski said, we're about two to three weeks behind some bigger counties like Cuyahoga and Franklin to reach our peak. And they've already started inching back down. So. Hopefully, we will follow in their giant footsteps and start to see some encouraging data here pretty soon. But again, this isn't an order that schools have to follow. A lot of districts did make the switch immediately after the board's vote, though. Mommy City Schools, for example, was ready and raring to go in person five days a week and did a complete 180 after hearing word of the board's recommendation, making the jump toward virtual learning. But not all are heeding that advice. Leaders with St. Ursula spoke up not long after the vote, saying it's up to the parents to decide if their kids should go back or not. The recommendation is to keep kids learning from home until October 1st, at which point the board can reevaluate the situation. But honestly, who knows what it's going to look like then? I mean, we can't predict two weeks from now, let alone two months. But rest assured, I will be here to keep you updated every step of the way. I'm sure that is very comforting. But that is all I have for you today. If you need more information on the stuff we talked about, including a list of what districts are doing and the recipe for my cheesy, Brazilian rolls. I have all of that conveniently waiting for you in a link in the description of this video. And if you like sipping tea with me and you like me, I need you to like this video, hit subscribe, and make me look good in front of my boss. But with all of that being said, I hope you get out there, make informed decisions, and I'll see you next time.